Hey, Sens fans, welcome to Season 5, Episode 18 of the Centennial Podcast. And I wish we could say that we were recording this under better circumstances, but since our last semi-optimistic video or episode, if you're listening in audio, the Sens have gone 0 4 0 some despicable performances against teams like the Washington Capitals, Nashville Predators, uh, that our own Bennett was boots on the ground for, the Arizona Coyotes, which I was unfortunately in the building for, and the Philadelphia Flyers. So that all happened. <laughs> we'll, we'll unpack that. Uh, we'll just talk about kind of our general observations that we have regarding the team right now. And, uh, and then we got a, a little bit of a open-ended uh, question that we'll get to that I think will maybe spark some potential debate and it'll be kind of interesting, but let's kick it off with the four games. The sense have played three of which were on the road. It was not pretty things kind of looked like they were on the up and up and then they quickly just bottomed out. So I'll throw it off to Bennett first. Bennett, like I said, you were on the ground in Nashville. So maybe you can give us a little report at the end of the episode about that, but your general observations on on the four games here that the Sens have maybe showed up for, kind of. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, showed up is is generous, I think, based on how some of these games went. Uh, like you said, losses to Washington, Nashville, Arizona, and Philly. I mean, uh, the Sens were outscored nine to nineteen in those four games, so they're giving up a lot of goals. Uh, and I mean, we ran into a hot Nashville team that's sort of, you know, that happens. I don't, I mean, it was kind of an ugly loss, but I don't fault them too, too much for that. Uh, the Philly game was at least like kind of competitive, although I think the scoreline flattered the Sens because we really did not play very well. But I think in particular, the losses to Washington and Arizona were tough to swallow because neither of those teams are having very good seasons. Washington have quite clearly, you know, you know, gone off a cliff and father time has caught up to that team. Uh, Arizona, we're in the midst of a terrible losing streak. And of course, we decided to be the ones to help them back out of it. Uh, it's just really, uh, just those ones in particular rankle because like, you know, Washington is a team that we should be like clearly above at this point. Like they were kind of like one of those teams that at the start of every season when you're doing your preview, it's like, oh, like where could a team like Ottawa, who who are the teams that Ottawa has to finish above in order to be a playoff team this year? And Washington is like the one team that we always mention because like they're clearly past it. Their window is firmly shut. Like, you know, Ovechkin finally seems to have, you know, uh, hit, uh, you know, come back down to like mortality and, uh, and, you know, and yet like they're a team that dusted us, you know, two thirds of the way through the season uh, when compared to at the start of the season, you know, we like trounced them. And so it's just like, that was really difficult to see. And, uh, you know, I think what's what's particularly difficult as well, and we can talk a little bit more about this later when we, you know, shift over to the big picture of where this team is going, but you just see the same tired kind of like storylines repeating themselves over and over. It's like, I was listening to the, the Philly game um because you know the games start at around my son's bedtime so we have to work around that a little bit um and so we often end up listening to the first period on the radio and you know tsn were listing off their you know three keys to the game for the senators and hearing it it just it just reminds you of how little has changed for this team they're saying they need to play a full 60 minutes how long have we been saying that they said that they needed to not you know get discouraged or mentally boomed every time something goes wrong like when you give up an early goal it's exactly what happened and you know they need to you know play with confidence and you know try and you know give a full effort and play a full 60 and it's just like it's the same kind of shit that we were ragging on dj for always saying the sense needed to do and the sense have still not exercised those demons and, you know, it's the same thing that we've been saying basically ever since, like, the pandemic restart in 2021. We've been sitting here like, this team doesn't play a complete three periods. This team, you know, gets easily kind of, like, blown off course when things go south in a game. Uh, this team lacks, like, you know, some, like, a mental edge. And uh, we're still saying that years and years later. And we're on our second coach now. I think a lot of those problems 
have shown signs of improving, but have clearly not fully gone away. And it's just, uh, it just makes you think about where this team is going and what it's going to take for them to take that next step because it clearly hasn't happened. Yeah, and we'll definitely touch on the bigger picture in our next little segment, but um, I'll first keep it uh, back to these these four losses. And, you know, they are, I guess, kind of, like you said, Ben, like just a little microcosm of, I think, the greater trend that we've seen over the last number of years. But, uh, Matt, your thoughts on the last four L's the Suns have taken? Well, I guess it it, it kind of starts in – stops with with goaltending i mean we had just had a really good uh conversation on the last podcast about how forsberg can come in and just be the calm cool collected uh uh goalie that we need him to be um and then he gets pulled in the washington game um you know we don't get good goaltending uh against against nashville uh, we don't get it against Arizona. Um, and, you know, to to Sogard's credit against Philly, he kept them in it. But one good goaltending performance out of four games does not cut it. And they're, <laughs> this offseason is going to be uh, absolute hell for Steve Steos because, <clears throat> you know, he's going to have to find a coach. He's going to have to find you know, players to inject into the lineup. He's going to need to find another right-hand shot D. Um, and then finally, he's going to need to figure out the goaltending problem. Um, you know, is he going to buy out Corpus Allo? Uh, Is he going to try and trade uh, Anton Forsberg? Does um, Sogard even, like, amount to anything? Uh, it, like, all of these question marks are so, like poignant going forward because it's just you don't know what you have um with this team if you can't get a goddamn save um and like it's so frustrating to watch them lose to washington um when darcy kemper is not good anymore and they could have easily won that game if they just got solid goaltending but you know, here we are. And like to lose to Arizona after going rallying three, de- three, nothing down, uh, tying that game up and then losing. I just knew they were going to as well. Like it was just a foregone conclusion that they were going to lose to the team that had lost 14 straight. Um, and it was, you know, at the end of the day, it was because goaltending let them down. And that's, that's, that's the story of the season. Um, right when you think this team is taking a step forward, they find a way to take three steps back. Um, they play down to their perform, uh, their opponents. And quite frankly, I looked at this four game stretch and said, these four games are crucial, uh, that going forward, I was like, they can win all of them. They are a better team than all of them and lost to all of them. I'd argue, the, Maybe the exception to that was Nashville just due to their hot streak and getting solid goaltending from Saros. But I, I think basically you're right. They were four winnable games. Yep. Um, And not even a single point. <laughs> yep, exactly. Especially considering how good they were um, from January on. And then after, after... They put up that stat about how the Sens were like seven and f- seventeen and four, something like that, something crazy. They were they were doing nice things, and it just blew up. I remember Sportsnet putting that stat up, and I said like, "Oh, we're gonna get cooked now." <laughs> we did. Uh, you know, don't don't point out the obvious until we're there. And then Sportsnet did it. They always have a f- have a way of ruining Ottawa Senators' seasons. Uh, it's generally Gary Galley that does that, but you know, I guess, uh, I guess it's it's just the entire network. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, I had to see that Arizona game in person, and uh, when Ottawa was down three zero, I was like, "What are we doing here? <laughs> what? Yeah. What is this?" And uh, thankfully, you know, they came back to at least tie it. It was good to see them putting that effort. There are obviously days where this team 
Um, you know, this season obviously hasn't been all sunshine and rainbows, but there were times with it where this team would fold. They would get scored on two or three times in a row, and that was it. Game over. So it's at least at least the one little thing I can take away is it's nice to be able to see them not get themselves so down that they can't pull back. But it's still really frustrating to see them lose totally winnable games, you know, or have games where they're playing such a strong defensive game, but then no offense comes. And then you let in a bad goal and all of a sudden that's it. Game's over. Like, I don't know. It's, it's little things. And I guess we'll get to the the general observations that we have on the team and, and really, you know, our grievances with it and I know we've all kind of touched on that now we've expanded beyond the four game sample and are diving into that a little bit so I mean I'll throw it back to Bennett and uh what's on your mind with this team what are you feeling right now well I mean there's so many different things that you could talk about I think Matt uh Nave wanted to ask the question in a moment of has the rebuild failed or has the rebuild gone wrong and we can get to that in like a sec but just there's one thing that I wanted to touch on, and it's like that this team is, uh, you know, we're about to face down the trade deadline, and the team is bottom of the Atlantic and 28th in the league. And I still see Senators fans saying, talking about hockey trades, and oh, we can get these, uh, if we trade Tarasenko and Chikrin, you know, we can get some picks and we can package that for a better player. And it's like, have you been watching? where this team is like if there's one mistake that the sense have made repeatedly in these seven years that we have missed the playoffs it's making win now moves at times when the senators have given no inclination that they're ready to win now uh and i give like a possible pass to the duchene trade because i was coming off the back of a eastern conference final appearance um but i think in hindsight that was potentially misguided and you know Debrinkat and Chikrin in hindsight are also somewhat misguided it looks like because those were kind of like win now trades when the Sens hadn't really done anything to prove that they're ready to win now yet and you know we've just spent the last however many months talking about how poor this team's compete level is and how far away they are from being a contender and I still see people every day saying, oh, so yeah, like you, if we trade Tarasenko and Chikrin, we can take those picks and then we can go fix our right-hand side. It's like, why? Why would we don't need a right-hand side that works when you don't have goaltending and you don't need forward depth when you don't have goaltending and you don't even really need goaltending when you don't have the other ones. So it's just like this team is more than one move away from being a contender. It's like, five years and five or six pretty big upgrades away from being a contender. And I think that people have yet to fully grasp that because they're still, they looked at the trades like to bring cat and chicken. It's like, Oh, well maybe those haven't worked out as well as we wanted to, but we're still right there. Right? No, this team is not right there. They're, we're not a season. We're not one strong season away from being a competitive team. We are, years of pain from being there and if we're going to move guys like Tarasenko and Chikrin uh Chikrin we don't expect to see in the off season until the off season I think if we're going to see a Chikrin trade uh because it's not a great market for a defenseman right now we'd be probably trading him at a loss but you know I say we take that Tarasenko pick and we fucking pick with it because we <laughs> need prospects now more than we need guys like Tarasenko um anyway and so i mean that is perhaps the segue that you need nave to then jump into where you wanted to go yeah it's 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 hard i mean i was just thinking about uh, the ottawa senators today and and how the rebuild has has just been one of those things and i was perusing the athletic this morning and i saw their their prospect rankings by scott wheeler is finished um, and Ottawa ranked 31st of 32 teams. Um, and then uh, our counterparts that are actually in similar scenarios with their rebuilds, uh, the Buffalo Sabres and the Detroit Red Wings, were first and second. That's tough. 
when you are yeah. uh, when you're a, you, when you're a team that is not even remotely close to the playoffs, um, and and you're and yet still also have an empty pipeline. Yeah, 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 like that's that's the challenge of it. Our best prospect, according to the Athletic, is Tyler Clevin. And like this isn't this isn't a slight on Tyler Clevin at all. Like I think he'll be a solid defenseman. Um, I don't think he tops out. And like this is the peak of his potential. If he hits everything, everything goes well. Probably just becomes like a top four D man at most. And like I really don't foresee him being more than maybe a fifth defenseman. Um, you know. Like I look back, it's so many unforced errors. Um, like the Tyler Boucher pick will always they, like it's gonna go down as the biggest draft bust. Um, uh, probably Neil Yakupov, but <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry for the Ottawa Senators. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, Neil Yakupov is is the number one, the worst draft bust. Uh, then Patrick Stefan. Um, but anyways. It's it's Tyler Boucher for for the Ottawa Senators. Why? Because he's a top ten pick, um, and he he's barely played pro games this year. Um, is not producing in those games, and was the last first round pick that we made. That's tough. Like we had, and then and then. Two years straight, we didn't have a first round pick. One we traded to Arizona for Jacob Chikrin. And then the other we traded to Chicago for Alex DeBrincat. And I I liked those deals at the time. It's hard not to when you are acquiring talent to improve your roster for the now. DeBrincat is gone. <laughs> um, and you know, according to Darren Dreger as of today. Uh, the market has picked up on Jacob Chikrin because there aren't a lot of really good defensemen available other than Noah Hannafin. Um, and the deal with uh, Chikrin is he has one more year as opposed to Hannafin being a uh, a free agent. Like, not having anything coming outside of this team uh, is sad. At least... In the last like four years of this podcast's existence, we could always say there's always next year. There's always oh Josh Norris is coming up. Uh, Brady Brady's playing his first year this year. Oh Tim Stutzla. Oh my God. And this year I guess was Ridley Gregg. Like it's like oh Ridley Gregg's he's here like finally, and now it's like oh yeah Angus Krushank like hell yeah like <laughs> no. Like he's a very good prospect in the sense that like he's killing it at the AHL level, but like I don't foresee him being in our top six and it, maybe even our top nine because it like we don't need help there. Like the two major areas that we need to improve is a is our D and right shot defenseman, obviously, because Travis Hamannick and Jacob Bernard Docker are not it. Um, and then, and then goaltending, you know, um, I don't, I don't look at much. There's not a lot out there that, that will help us, um, that that's going to be on the free agent market. So you're going to have to trade for a goalie probably. Um, and, you know, not a lot of goalies that are really good are available unless you're knocking somebody's socks off. So, like, are we just in this perpetual state of, like, Pierre Dorian just absolutely screwing us? And now we're just here. We're, you know, back in the bottom of the league. Uh, and, we, uh, hey, g good news. We have a pick this year. And absolutely, we should probably use it to pick something. Two picks um, right now. Yes, uh, we have another first round pick that is Boston's, um, which is great, I guess. And like, I, I, I get the idea of like, you know, use it to pick. And I'd be happy if they used it to pick. But if they also went and improved the roster for 
next year. I wouldn't be opposed to that, but it would need to be a decent, you know, choice. And also, I saw that Elliot Friedman was talking about that the Flames took a one last pitch at Chris Tanev, and it was three years at four point five million dollars for a th- to a thirty four year old. Do you want to saddle your horse? And like I, this, he's a good defenseman. Don't get me wrong, but three years to a thirty four year old at that much money. And that's the option we've been looking at the most. Like, holy Moses. Yeah. Now, now there's probably a lot to unpack there, but I think definitely when you look at the trade market of what Ottawa could bring in, it doesn't look great. And, you know, right now they're sitting at the fifth highest odds of winning the lottery. You know, a top five pick would be huge. They really need to get... Uh, And I believe I was talking to you guys about this earlier. They need at least one blue chip prospect back in their system. They also need a couple of solid prospects. And, you know, if they get a first for Tarasenko and they get uh, end up having three first round picks in the draft, that's likely going to be at least two solid prospects aside from the top five pick. If the Sens end up choosing a a player there. So um, I think This draft will go a long way to helping restock the cupboards. Going back to your point about Buffalo and Detroit, let's not forget that Buffalo is rebuilding on their rebuild. They had Eichel, and he was supposed to be the prime centerpiece of the rebuild, and it didn't work out. They shipped him off. They've been rebuilding for how long now? I think the rebuild's been twice as long as Ottawa's. So I don't. Yeah, and that's them. also not saying that they're not ahead of our rebuild, but at least they have prospects. Yes, they've also <laughs> had two first overall picks and are yep. still not hitting the playoffs. So there's something to be said about that. Uh, now that said, Detroit, yes, they are ahead of us, and on paper, I would argue their roster is worse. I think with Ottawa, when it comes to their trades at the time, really like the Debrincat trade, really like the Chikrin trade. Neither of those players. Um, either played to their potential or being on the roster now are playing to their potential. Like neither of them did that. Debrinkat was supposed to come in and be this 40 goal plus guy who could play with Tim Stutzla. It didn't end up working out like that. He wasn't the power play guy that we anticipated him being. Uh, And, you know, it showed he ended up not getting as many top minutes on the power play. And then you look at Jacob Chikrin. He was a really, really good defenseman in Arizona. And then he came to Ottawa, and you know what? He's still been decent. He's not bad compared to some of the defensemen the Sens have brought in, but he's been extremely underwhelming. And, you know, he's he's a guy who was the hottest defenseman in the league on the trade market, and it took so long for them to trade him. And he just hasn't amounted to that, I guess, potential that he was showing on Arizona. But now he has the health. It's like he's healthy, <laughs> but he's not playing as well as he's playing as Arizona. So I think there are some of these moves where they seemed reasonable. They made sense. You're improving your roster, but then they just don't play up to their potential and the team just doesn't click with those guys. And now we're looking at a situation where you need to go back into the trade market or go back into free agency and you need to bring in whoever uh, to, to replace these guys. And man, if I, I really like Tarasenko, I wouldn't have an issue if Ottawa extended him. However, them trading him and if Chikrin, you know, the market heats up, like Drager says, and the Sens can get a decent, let, let's just say like a first rounder, a B-level prospect and another draft pick or something. I say they take that and then they'd have four first round picks potentially if, if Tarasenko also goes for first with a retained salary uh, by Ottawa. If you have four first round picks, I say you draft all those positions in the draft. Just refill the cupboards. Like, I mean, I know that seems silly for a team that's looking to build upon what they have. But at the same time, I think Steos and the rest of the staff need time to evaluate like what they have here, what they truly have, not what they got when they came into the club and were like, okay, this is our team now. Like, let's remember, Steos didn't, you know champion himself become self-proclaimed gm until like december so 
like Bennett said, they'll they'll need to get new coaching staff on board. Um, I don't know what they do with the goaltending, but that's another question mark. It would have been really nice if they offer sheeted Swayman last summer, but you can't change the past. Um, all this to say, that's just kind of my my random <laughs> general observations. You know, going back to your question of has the rebuild gone wrong? Um, I would say not wrong. I would say it's gone sideways. They have time to fix this. Uh, I'll throw it back to my reference I made in either, I think it was two weeks ago now, um, our podcast episode then. But, you know, Tampa Bay, they had a lot of issues early on, and they had some very, very quality players. Stamkos, Hedman, both young guys. Um, I believe they also had guys like Kucherov in their system at the time. Um, It wasn't until they started adding players like Vasilevsky, they drafted in the first round, they decided to make that Duran for Sergachev swap with Montreal. That's when they started to actually make progress. And then they ended up winning two Stanley Cups off the back of those moves. So I think Ottawa has time to do that. You know, Stamkos, like he was 29, I think, when he won his first cup. So you never know when it'll happen, but the Sens do have a lot of runway ahead of them. All their young players are on big deals, whether people are a fan of those contracts or not. They have like time to sort this out. You will lose a guy like Giroux, and that will suck. You know, you won't be in your Stanley Cup window and have Giroux on this club anymore. That's just something we have to accept, and it it friggin' sucks because he's a hell of a player right now. But yeah, there there's just some harsh realities that this team will have to face. And like Bennett said, I don't think it'll be like five years, but Bennett, you said more pain, and yeah, it'll be more pain. And I think we're you know potentially two three years out but that's that's just the way it is and i was hoping that we were two or three years out two or three years ago but here we are today so that's my ramble over uh bennett if you want to take the reins because matt and i both had our little little rants then uh then go for it yeah i think the question has the rebuild failed has it gone wrong it depends on your definition and what your expectations were i think we've talked so many times on this podcast of all the different ways damage that was done under the melnick era but one of the things that i think uh is worth a mention and is sort of an underrated consequence was that you know declaration that he made that in four years time this team would be you know a contender after botting it out and getting younger and drafting high the Sens would be you know pushing for contention within four years and I think that created a lot of sort of like unrealistic expectations in this market (laughs) that consciously or unconsciously people kind of internalized that first as a meme but then as sort of like an unconscious sort of like timeline and I think it was really damaging because it's not a realistic representation of how long it takes to build a winning team from nothing. Um, and the sense started with nothing. Like we did yeah. not have like we did not have guys like Mark Stone or Matt Duchesne sticking around to help show the young guns the ropes. Like we had nothing. Like we ash- absolutely burnt it to the ground. And you know how many teams have gone from tearing it all down to like the studs and rebuilding to success in four years i can't think of any of them like you mentioned how long it took tampa you know colorado avalanche who are considered by many to be sort of like a model of how to build a good team um they drafted mckinnon first overall in 2013 and it took them nine years to win a stanley cup and i don't think that you know i think our best equivalent draft year of like you know, yes, we took Brady to Chuck in 2018. I recognize that. But I think we would all sort of say the 2020 draft was really what kickstarted the Sens rebuild. And we're only four years past that. And I think we have a long way to go before we're going to have the depth and the quality in all positions that we need to be a contender. Um, And to your guys' point, you mentioned this already, but, you know, this team, like, it's going to take time to get to where we need to get to like the goaltending is not an easy fix like anyone who's been out here saying we just trade for a goalie you just signed a goalie like where how who 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 is available that we could sign that would make this team better tomorrow i can't think of anyone um who is going to be available next year 
I can't think of anyone. You got to draft these guys and you got to give them three years, four years, five years to come through. Like that's not, you can't solve that next season. And if you try and solve it next season, you're going to do the exact same thing that we've been doing to ourselves for the last seven years, which is, oh, we'll just draft a 40, we'll just trade for a 40 goal scorer and we'll move a year's worth of draft capital to get him. And oh, whoops, he didn't want to sign here and also sucks. Like, yeah. oh, well, like, let's shore up the right hand side. Let's move a year's worth of draft capital to go get a guy and he can get comes a left handed shot to, yeah. to shore up the right side. Yes. And it's like, oh, we've been playing him out of position and he doesn't really look like he's the answer. It's like, oh, well, there's another year kicking the can down the road. It's like, if you make these short term, short sighted win now moves to try and right a sh- sinking ship, you will fail. And you will fail over and over again. And if there's one thing that Steos needs to learn from the years of Dorian prior to this, it's that you can't build a winning team in the trade market. And you can't build a winning team by signing other people's cast-offs and throwaways. You build it in the draft. And we've only drafted, like, three guys that, like, are absolute, like, game-breakers. And, you know, like maybe, maybe even like that's generous, like maybe like two, like Stutzler and Brady and like some very, very solid guys like Sanderson and, you know, like to a lesser extent, like maybe like Shabbat and Batherson, like we don't have the, we don't have the juice and we're not going to get the juice by trying to, you know, trade for a right hand D and a defense and a goalie and like, maybe like a center who's not injured all the time, i.e. Josh Norris. Like, you can't trade for those guys. Like, you got to just draft them and develop them. And that means this is going to take longer. And people don't want to hear that because Melnick was running his mouth and saying how this would all just, you know, hey, guys, trust me, you know, even though you have no reason to trust me after everything I've put this franchise through. But yeah, four years, promise, we'll be, we'll be good again. And... It's been seven years and we're nowhere near there and uh, we're not going to be anytime soon. Uh, I, you know, I, and I just, I, this, this idea that you can trade or sign your way out of where the senators are right now, I think is a fail is like a fantasy. And I really don't see how we get to a point where we're a year in year out contender without just waiting a long time and drafting guys and playing it safe and playing it smart and yeah i don't know i mean like this team is up against the cap and they are one of the worst teams in the league how did that happen this team you know traded significant draft capital to fix their defense and still has like gaping holes how did that happen you know this team has traded for or signed several marquee goaltenders who have completely shat the bed and you know why did we do that like you could have you could have literally not traded for Matt Murray and not signed him and not signed Corpusello and we would be in exactly the same position if not possibly better like we wouldn't be worse if we had just let Gustafson or Sogard or someone take the reins like I don't I don't think the Sogard is the guy but like he can't he's not worse than Corpusello is no. right now and I don't know it's just like we've It's like we keep the senators, they keep making these kind of like short term decisions. And that's what keeps setting us back. And like you said, Matt, like shifting the rebuild kind of sideways in time. You know, this team doesn't have a window. It never had a window. If it wants to have a window, it needs to like. I I think the answer has the rebuild failed. You know, it's failing so far. And I think we need kind of like a reset where we get rid of the guys whose timelines are not going to align with a window four years from now. That means Sheru. It might mean Shabbat, you know, it'd be nice to keep a guy like Patterson because he's on a pretty good deal. Like it'd be sort of, I feel like it would be sort of counterproductive to trade him, but uh, you know, a lot of the guys that are on the team that are, you know, quote unquote, part of the core, you know, they might be part of the core if we were competitive today, but we're not. And in three or four years time, you know, maybe they're not here either. So that's all I have to say. Yeah. yeah. I think honestly, that's 
a good way to conclude it really um all i was gonna add is i i agree like with where the sends are at uh, you know, you also look at the city, their pull is never going to be in free agency anyway. Building out of the draft is the best option the Sens have, and they've had some good hits. And, you know, Batherson being a fourth round pick is an example of that. At the same time, good teams are the ones who make those trades for peace to put them really over the edge. You know, you look at Tampa Bay, they already had like everything they needed they added like a guy like Brandon Hagel because they're like, yo, we need a guy who's an up and comer. He's talented. He can fit in as a depth piece and he's gotten better and better in time with them. And that's a perfect guy who's grown with them and allows them to stay competitive. You look at a guy like Sergachev, they traded one of their struggling young guys and managed to get a defender who helped and still is a steady top four guy. But they don't need to go looking for all the pieces. Like, they don't need to find, like, a top two defenseman. They don't need to find, um, like, a, a true second-line center. You know, they these are all established. They just need to find core, like, a couple of supporting players who can fit into that core and uh, and are talented enough to just really amplify it. And I don't think the Sens have been successful at doing that. They've tried. Chikrin and Debrincat were examples of them trying to do that. Uh, but neither worked out. So it's either an evaluation issue or something else, but uh, it's something that needs to get righted before this rebuild can can really grow into the team not being a rebuilder and maybe not being a Stanley Cup competitor, but at least being a playoff caliber team. Yeah, I, I, I just look at the roster and, and the makeup of it currently, and I as much as it pains me to say it it's just like there's there's so much of this roster that just has underperformed this season um you know our goaltending became like the worst option possible it you know should have been just like fine and it has not at all um our defense you know some guys just kind of took a step back and yeah, it's it's unfortunate and I'm I'm glad that we're able to have this therapeutic conversation now. Um and it'll be nice to see this season end. And I'd I'd really like to hear about Bennett's trip, truthfully. Because, yeah, let's let's <laughs> yeah. end on a positive, Bennett. <laughs> yeah. You were in Nashville. The Sens may not have won, but uh, how was your road trip experience? Yeah, it was cool. It was the first time that uh, I'd ever seen the Senators as an away fan, um, not even in like Montreal, Toronto. Uh, and so it was really neat to go uh, see see them play in another city. Uh, I was providing some uh, commentary and uh, uh, through our uh, through our Twitter page. Um, but to briefly summarize, I think the Bridgestone Arena where the Predators play is super cool. It's a really nice modern building. Um, I don't think it's actually, I think it was probably built at around the same time as CTC because the Preds only came into the season a couple of years after. Um, but it's night and day, the, the quality of the arena. They have a huge wide concourse with lots of food and beverage options, uh, multiple team shops, uh, just tons of, uh, tons of cool stuff. Uh, the quality of uh, all of the services was really good. Um, and it's right downtown, which is super cool. You know, you you walk right outside and you're there, you know, in like the main drag uh, of Nashville. You can hear, you know, honky tonks and country music and stuff blaring, uh, live music blaring from all of like the bars and, and restaurants right around it, which is cool. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just a really neat arena. It was a really cool experience. Uh, There's a lot of Senators fans there, not like, you know, hundreds, but dozens for sure. And that was really neat to see as well. Uh, walking to the game, we ran into a retired couple that were saying that they're starting their kind of like bucket list of hitting all of the rinks in the league. And this was first on their stop. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. You know, who among us wouldn't want to do that? And uh, yeah, all I had to say is, that, you know, I think it, it gives me hope for what downtown arena for the Senators could be. And even if it takes this team, you know, a number of seasons to get to the point where they're a contender. I think maybe in the next few years, if we could at least get a downtown arena, it would just make it so much more fun to be a Sens fan 
just being able to, you know, get out there, have a look at the Ottawa River, you know, off in the distance as you walk out of the arena, hop on a train and be right, you know, on in the market or, you know, just a short walk from Bank or Elgin or where all the nice bars are. Um, you know, it's just, it's, uh, it was really fun time uh, in Nashville. The crowd was great. And I think that, you know, it just gave me, in a way, it gave me hope for the future of what it could be like to be a Suns fan in a few years. So we can leave it on that positive note. Cool. Well, on that note, thank you everybody for watching or listening and uh, maybe having a bit of a heart to heart therapy session <laughs> with the boys from the Centennial. So thanks for joining us today. Therapy is expensive, but the Centennial is free. Exactly, baby. <laughs> That's what it'd be. Okay, you can so- find us on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. What, what what's the what's the meme? It's like when your card declines at therapy, and so they just show you the Chris Kudit school over and over again. <laughs> Why would you do that to poor people listening or watching? What the hell? Uh, Jeez. You're like, yeah, let's end on a positive. By the way, trauma. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Sensetennial, Instagram the Sensetennial. Uh, we're also on Reddit and Discord. If you're in the Sense Discord, it's a it's a bit of a happier place, depending on the day, I guess. <laughs> uh, so uh, join us on there as well. Thank you, everybody, for listening or watching, and we'll see you after the trade deadline. Go Sense, go Sense.